Hence, cohort. Last psychoanalytic thinker we reflected upon was Donald Winnicott. And in this lecture, we'll reflect upon, take an overview of less known, unappreciated, largely, and yet someone who has excavated esoteric, amorphous, but very precious insights in psychoanalysis. And that person is Haynes Kohut. Haynes Kohut created a school of psychoanalysis called the Self Psychology School. Kohut, in terms of his technique of therapy, is radically different from conventional psychoanalysis. Conceptually also he is very different, but technique wise, he is even more radically different. Some of the cornerstones of psychoanalytic technique are turned upside down by Kohut. Unfortunately, Kohut has fallen out of flavor of the day. In any area of intellectual enterprise, there is a temporal catwalk, a catwalk of ideas. Kohut is no longer on the ramp in that catwalk. Few could understand Kohut. Few could develop him. Few could see the preciousness and value of what he was trying to say and do, even though what he was trying to say and do was not very crystal clear. However, the tragedy that self-psychology today is studied by very few people and even fewer who are trained in psychoanalytic institutes know Kohut. In India, at least the situation is so tragic that I know of. Hardly anyone even knows about Kohut, leave around, leave aside having studied Kohut or understood Kohut or to practice Kohut is a far off thing. I don't think in, in India, in a country of 1.5 billion people, I don't think there would be more than 10 people who practice Kohut even partially. One of the difficulties of Kohut was he could never create a model of the mind in which he could locate structurally what he was trying to say, the concept of the self. Nor could he explain in functional terms in the context of any model of the mind. The psychological processes he was referring to which in his view were critical to pathogenesis and healing. With this short introduction, let us take to the chapter on Hitz Kohut. Question one, who was Hitz Kohut? Hitz Kohut was an American psychoanalyst who founded 
a school of psychoanalysis called the self psychology school or the Kohushian school of psychoanalysis. Two, why was he called Mr. Psychoanalysis? Because Kohut used to eat, drink, and breathe psychoanalysis all the time. You could take Kohut out of the therapy room, but you could never take the therapy room out of Kohut. He was always inside it, and so his friends used to nickname him as Mr. Psychoanalysis. Three, did Kohut himself undergo multiple analysis? Yes, he did. And this is true of many other psychoanalysts. This is true of Beyond. This is also true, I think, of Winnicott. This was also true of one of my supervisors who told me he underwent analysis twice. And the second time was to overcome the first one. And this happens to many clients. They say, I went for therapy the second time, partly to overcome the first therapy, what happened in the first therapy. We don't know why Kohut went for two different analysts, something private to his life. We don't know about it. The first analyst we don't know about, but the second one we know, it is in public domain. August Eichhorn, who was a close friend of Sigmund Freud and who and Kohut borrowed concepts from him and in turn, Icon also developed some of Kohut's uh, concepts knowingly or unknowingly. Fourth, why did he have to break free from existing school and create one of his own? Kohut realized in his own analysis that something fundamentally was missing in the conventional approach, not only of one particular school of psychoanalysis, but from all schools of psychoanalysis. There was something axiomatically missing from the entire enterprise of psychoanalysis as such. Doesn't matter which school of psychoanalysis you are referring to. So something common which was missing and missing in all the schools and Kohut experienced it firsthand that the conventional approach, especially the technique and of course technique flows from pathogenesis. Kohut realized that the conventional enterprise has something centrally missing. What is missing may not be critically relevant for everyone, but for one group of patients, the group to which Kohut himself belonged, to that group, Conventional psychoanalysis was completely, not only inadequate, but at times counterproductive. Because this group needed something very different from what psychoanalysis was offering. Kohut could not figure out initially what was it. Over a period of his own healing journey, like Freud, like Jung, Kohut figured out that what was healing him was not found in any existing school of psychoanalysis, but was something new. And in his own autobiographical analysis, which he wrote in a paper, the analysis of Mr. Z, in that self journey, Kohut realized 
that apart from dry frustration that Freud referred to, apart from object relations that Klein referred to, there was a third line of pathology. So there is a dry frustration line and one group of patients develop pathology because of something on this line. And then there is this object relations line where another group of patients develops pathology because of this line. And some of course would have both of these lines, pathology from both these lines. But free from both these two, there is a third line which Kohut called the line of the self. And Kohut called pathology which develops on this third line as self-pathology. And the school which focuses on this concept of self, self-pathology and healing of self-pathology, Kohut called his own school by the name self-psychology. Central to Kohut was the concept of the self. And this self can be a healthy self or unhealthy self. If the self is healthy, nothing to worry about. The person is normal. If the self is just healthy or if the self is very healthy, the person becomes very industrious, very successful. But if the self is healthy, nothing to worry about. That person is not a concern proper of psychoanalysis or psychotherapy in the traditional sense of the term. Of course, one can come to psychoanalysis from a Socratic standpoint or from self-enhancement standpoint, but that is very rare. Usually, people come to psychoanalysis for psychotherapy. And from that point, the healthy self is not something that would often come for psychoanalysis. However, if the self is unhealthy, then self-pathology develops. And this self-pathology cannot be cured or healed by conventional approaches in psychoanalysis, neither by Freudian approach nor by Kleinian approach. Kohut said it requires a completely new understanding of why self-pathology develops, because self-pathology does not develop by dry frustration, as Freud used to say, or early life object relations in the sense client used to say. Kohut said the healthy self develops if a good childhood is experienced and by good childhood he means certain things. If certain things happen right, a healthy self is created. If those things happen wrong, a unhealthy self is created. We will see parallels between client and Kohut in a moment, but for the moment, just be with this. So, a self exists. Kohut does not clear, clearly define the self. But the self is definitely not the ego. The self is much bigger than the ego. One approximate definition of self is it is the sum total of the personality. Another more accurate definition which I like is it is the social ego. And the moment I use the word social ego, the question comes, how is it different from Freud's ego? And I conceptualize ego in this way, that you can look at ego in three parts. The unconscious system ego, the intrapsychic coordinator ego, the social ego. And when we conceptualize ego in these three ways, the social ego, that becomes 
very close to Kohut's self. <clears throat> One parallel we find is in the model of the mind of Sri Aurobindo. What he calls the external ego is very close to Kohut's concept of the self. Any injury to this self is felt around the heart center, around the chest center, sorry, chest center. Kohut does not go into this kind of locating of feelings related to the self, but this is my analysis. Coming back to Kohut, Kohut says there is something called the self. And this self is not inborn, it gets created in interaction with the environment. That is where this self is, is different from Jung's concept of the self and it's also different from Winnicott's concept of the self. Kohut's self is not inborn like Jung's self. Kohut's self also is not the coordinator of program of life like the Jung's self is. Kohut's self also is not a dualistic entity like in case of Winnicott where you have a true self and the false self. Kohut's self is phenomenological, not inborn. And the self is created in interaction with the environment, especially the parents and early caregivers. If this interaction goes right, and if the constitution is not very difficult, a healthy self is formed. If this interaction or the constitution is not right, an unhealthy self is formed. Unhealthy self, Kohut categorizes into three categories. Unhealthy self can be a psychotic self, a borderline self, or a narcissistic self. And all the three are on a continuum. Narcissistic self, borderline self, psychotic self. Narcissistic self, relatively speaking of the three, is the most cohesive and stable and strong. Borderline is more fragile, more easy to disintegrate compared to narcissistic. And psychotic is least healthy and the most prone to disintegration. For Kohut, cohesion and disintegration are very important concepts. So when the self is in a healthy mode, it is cohesive. And when it is in an unhealthy mode, it is disintegrating. In fact, the disintegration of the self leads to a pathological state. Kohut, like Winnicott, places relative importance of environment higher than that of constitution. So Kohut is more near to Winnicott when it comes to relative significance of constitution and environment, very different from Klein who places, relatively speaking, higher emphasis on constitution. What Winnicott used to call good enough mothering, a parallel concept to that would be in Kohut, good enough environment for creation of a healthy self. So Kohut is not focused primarily on the mother like Winnicott is, but both of them are focused on the environment. In the environment, Vinaycott is more focused on the mother, whereas Kohut is not focused on the mother, but rather his focus is spread out on all the caregivers. So the relative significance of mother in the child's environment is less in Kohut than in Vinaycott.
one question can be underlying in an elemental sense can there be Freudian, Kleinian, Bionian phenomena going on below the level at which cohort operates? And the answer would be yes. Limitation is nobody has as yet worked wide enough to integrate the two schools or the three schools like provide a Freudian, Kleinian basis to the cohesion phenomena. There have been some papers, but nothing which can provide a, a deeper, wider integration. Kohut's idea of pathogenesis and healing is based upon certain phenomena which occur in early life. This phenomena being mirroring, idealization, empathy, self-object experiences, twinship experiences, alter ego experiences, cohesiveness, disintegration, impingement, holding. So these are some of the phenomena that Kohut talks about that if this phenomena occur right in the environment, a healthy self develops. If something goes right, wrong in either of them or all of them, a unhealthy self develops which can be narcissistic borderline or psychotic. Kohut sees pathology, self-psychology, self-pathology at least, if not all pathology. Kohut sees self-pathology essentially as an arrest. That a child is passing through a normal developmental process and somewhere the process is arrested. If the child gets fixated there and from that point a pathology develops. So for him, the core of healing was to restart this developmental process. And once done, the mind will on its own slowly and gradually move towards a realistic self, a healthy self. Five. What school did Kohut create in psychoanalysis? <clears throat> Kohut created a school called Self Psychology, also called the Kohutian schools, Kohutian school of psychoanalysis. Six. What are the major concepts contributed by Kohut? Many concepts he has contributed. Some of the concepts are <clears throat> the concept of empathy, ego cohesion. Narcissistic line of development, healthy narcissism, impingement, self pathology, self defect, bipolar self, mirroring, idealization, arc of tension, self objects, twinship experiences, alter ego experiences, self cohesion, self disintegration, holding, a different kind of holding. How does Kohut define self? Kohut does not define self, although his entire theory is based on the concept of self and his school is called self-psychology. So he created the whole school called self-psychology without defining the self. Jung had a similar problem in defining his idea of the self, although his self is very different from Kohut's self. As I said, one way to look at it is to redefine the ego into three parts and the social ego we can define as Kohut's self. 
this is from an experiential standpoint. What is self-psychology? Self-psychology is an approach in psychoanalysis very different from the classical approaches of dry frustration or the object relations approach to pathology and healing. Nine, what according to Kohut is the essential path for self-formation? Kohut talks about some entity, some phenomena which have to happen right for formation of a healthy self. I listed out this phenomena a moment back, just to repeat it. Mirroring, idealization, self-object experiences, alter ego experiences, twinship experiences, a right arc of tension, cohesion, disintegration, empathy, lack of impingement. So on all these parameters, things have to go right for a healthy self to develop. Uh, I have given a detailed lecture on Kohut. So if you want to go into details of what is mirroring, what are the elements in mirroring, what are the elements in idealization, what are the elements in empathy, what are the elements in self-object experiences. If you want to deconstruct this Kohutian concepts and go into the constituent details, see that episode on the channel it, it should be labeled uh, should be titled self psychology or the Kohushian crisis or the crisis in Kohut something by that name then what is mirroring mirroring Kohut uses this word in a very special way. There are many ways in which this word is used. One use of the word mirroring is done by Lakam, which he uses in his conceptualization of the mirror stage. He does not use the word mirroring, but that process occurs. That is a very different use of the word mirroring. Second is the use in ISTDP to mirror back to the person in a different language something irrational he says. So if he says, I don't want to get well, the therapist can say, I understand what you are telling me that you don't want to get well. Let us just accept that this is your desire, that you don't wish to get well. This is to mirror the irrationality of what the client is saying, so that he comes back to the path of rationality. A very different use of the word mirroring. Kohut uses the word mirroring to mean something different. Kohut uses the word mirroring to suggest that the parents or the caregivers are like mirrors and they have to be reflecting mirrors, not the silent mirrors or the blank mirrors or the opaque mirrors. They have to be reflecting mirrors and they have to be colorfully reflecting mirrors, cheerfully reflecting mirrors. What happens is the child innately driven by his omnipotence and narcissism goes into exhibitionism of his omnipotence and expects the caregiver to admire him. If the parents or the caregivers are not admiring enough, the child who was in search of fame and in a narcissistic stage, suddenly feels his belief 
cracked to pieces and he moves to the other extreme from grandiosity to inferiority, from fame to shame. And for Kohut, this deeply unconscious repressed feeling of inferiority and shame is at the heart of narcissistic pathology. Kohut defines something called natural narcissism and something called healthy narcissism apart from pathological narcissism. For Kohut, narcissism is a natural stage of development and universal to everyone. We all pass through it. Just as Margaret Mahler used to say that we all pass through an autistic phase. Kohut used to say we all pass through a narcissistic phase. If we are not able to pass through that stage, we get fixated there and that is where the pathology takes root. But Kohut's mirroring is not only admiration, but actually if you go into a nuanced, deconstructed understanding of the concept of mirroring, you can deconstruct the word mirroring into five elements. The five A's of mirroring. Acknowledgement, attention, acceptance, affection and admiration. So the first stage of mirroring is that the child's existence is acknowledged. He is not dismissed into a corner. Second is, not only is his existence acknowledged, he gets attention, healthy attention. He also gets acceptance for what he is. He also gets affection and he gets admiration. Together, this whole package of five A's is the package of mirroring. And the pathological situation is of the silent mirror, the attacking mirror, the opaque mirror, or the non-mirroring non mirror. If mirroring fails, Kohut says, a healthy self is difficult to be created. So mirroring is one important element that goes into creation of a healthy self. The second element is idealization. Let us look at idealization. 11. What is idealization? Apart from mirroring, the child has a need to idealize the caregivers and internalize those ideals into oneself. And that deconstructed, idealization if you deconstruct, it goes into finding the right raw material to construct one's super ego. Finding something reliable, stable, finding something that upholds standards, finding something that is centered around a belief and ready to pay price for a belief and ready to work hard for a belief. All of these entities, the child looks into the parents and internalizes into himself by looking at the parents. It's like a creation into oneself by observing it outside. If the parents are not ideal enough, stable enough, reliable enough, believing in enough, upholding standards enough, responsible enough, there is very little for the child to idealize and internalize and that also is an ingredient for creating a healthy skin. 12. What is bipolar self? Kohut talks about in the journey of self-formation, one of the ideas Kohut talks about is that the self develops a pole of goals and a pole of ideals. Sorry, a pole of ideals and goals and the pole of competences. Sorry, that is arc of tension. The self develops a pole of ideals and the pole of goals. This is the bipolar self. 
on one hand are the ideals, on the second hand are the goals. Similarly, you have an arc of tension. You have the goals and you have the competences. Some would even put this together and say that the tension between the two poles of the bipolar self is actually the arc of tension. So in that case, what they would do is they would put ideals and goals on one end and competencies on the other end and look at the tension between the two. Fourteen, what is a healthy self and grandiose self? Kohut lists out 11 to 12 factors which I listed out before. If everything, if all of them go right, you develop a healthy self. If something goes wrong or many things go wrong, you develop an unhealthy self. And as I said, unhealthy self is further categorized into three categories. Psychotic self, borderline self and narcissistic self. Narcissistic self is also referred to by Kohut as the grandiose self. So this is the way Kohut conceptualizes that we all have innate omnipotence and grandiosity in narcissism and we all pass through the stage of a grandiose self. And if the grandiose self of ours in early childhood is allowed to live itself out and admired enough, supported enough by the environment, by people around us, the grandiose self over a period of time naturally moves, naturally gives up its omnipotence, starts learning from the environment, starts learning reality and moves from a grandiose position to a healthy, realistic position. If everything goes right, this is what happens. But if things don't go right, then the grandiose self is not able to live itself out a uh, arrest of development happens, a fixation happens, and it becomes a, instead of moving towards a realistic self, it remains fixated into itself as a narcissistic self, grandiose self. What is narcissism? Can there be healthy narcissism? Yes. For Kohut, there is something called healthy narcissism in adults, which leads us to great achievements in the real world. Similarly, there is a natural narcissism in early childhood, which all of us pass through as a stage, and then there is pathological narcissism. So there are three categories of narcissism, a natural narcissism as a stage, a pathological narcissism as a psychological difficulty, a pathology, and a healthy narcissism which enables adults to do extraordinary endeavors in reality. For Kohut, the diagnostic categories are three. So if you look at a diagnostic structure of Kohut, you have the psychotic person, the psychotic self, the borderline self, and the narcissistic self. Just as in Lacan, you have the diagnostic category of uh, uh, neurosis, psychosis, and perversion. In Kohut, you have psychosis, borderline, and narcissistic. And all the three are on a continuum. From psychosis to narcissistic personality, ego cohesion increases. So lowest ego cohesion and highest disintegration in terms of intensity and frequency is in the psychotic personality. Relative to psychotic personality, the borderline personality is slightly more stable and disintegration is occasional. In psychosis, disintegration 
of the self is quite frequent. In borderline, it is occasional and in narcissistic, it happens under stress. This is the cohort's diagnostic structure. The central part for cohort is ego cohesion or self cohesion. At times, cohort writes as though he was thinking of ego and self as synonymous. At times, he writes as though the two are very different and there should be no confusion between the two. So, at times he talks about self cohesion. At times he talks about ego cohesion and we get confused if they are the same or they are different and if they are different, how are they different? You can call it self cohesion also if that creates a confusion. But what is this cohesion about? The idea is that the ego is the coordinator of all the defenses and the strength of the defenses and the efficacy of defenses comes from the ego. If the ego disintegrates, ego does not have the strength or the efficacy to use defenses well or Power, give power to those defenses to fight against difficult material which is coming up. Ego would crack, disintegrate under stress from outside or inside. And Ovid's idea about pathology is very interesting. He says, In all healthy people, it is not the case that the Oedipus is completely resolved or the split is completely closed. However, despite Oedipus not being resolved and the split not being closed, you still don't see pathology in many cases. And this is a very, this is a very large group of population. Kohut says in a very large group of population, in fact, the majority, the Freudian issues, the Kleinian issues are not resolved adequately and yet there is no pathology. And this is because ego is strong enough, cohesive enough to put a lid onto those unresolved issues and thereby health is instituted. So most people are healthy not because the Freudian Kleinian issues have been resolved, but they have been successfully dealt with by defenses, although they are not resolved. And this, Kohut says, is one of the primary reasons for health. That if the ego is cohesive enough or the self is cohesive enough, strong enough, healthy enough, the self efficiently uses defenses and is strong enough to give power enough to the defenses to control pathology creating material. And this is a very different idea of pathogenesis and healing. The idea here is how to make the self more cohesive and strong and put a lid or use defenses more efficiently rather than go into elemental healing of the Freudian and the Kleinian difficulties. Not only this is a shortcut and the most pervasive way nature ensures health, but Kohut says very interestingly, if the self is not strong enough, even if we try directly to heal using Freudian, Kleinian or classical psychoanalytic methods, healing does not happen because 
it's very difficult to have a perfect resolution of the Oedipus or the split. Usually the resolution is partial and even that partial non-resolution is enough to create a pathology if the self is not strong enough. This is a very different conceptualization of pathogenesis and healing. Seventeen, what promotes ego cohesion? Right mirroring, idealization, empathy, experience in childhood, along with other factors, as we said, promotes ego cohesion. One of the very important elements is regulated absence of impingement, not regulated, but absence of impingement. What Vinaycott would say, going on being, non intrusion, it's very important for ego cohesion. The secure base is present but not intruding. That's very important for strong ego cohesion. Eighteen, what is impingement? It is repeated unwarranted intrusion into the child's world. When the child is involved in its own growth and pleasure activities, allow the child to be himself. What Vinaycott says, going on being. Then going on being in the presence of a secure base is very important. And intrusion is what we record, sorry, the Ovid calls impingement. 19, what is empathy? Empathy has various meanings. One is to be kind to the suffering of someone. Second is to identify with someone who go into his shoes and try to explore him from his vantage point. Third is attunement, where you are able to know what is unconscious in the patient and give words to it. And there are other meanings of the word empathy. You can look at the episode titled The Cohesion Crisis, where I have detailed out all these concepts. If caregivers are not empathic, but attacking or indifferent, healthy self-development is impeded. Empathy also comes from a good holding environment, a positive good holding environment, another way of expressing that. 20. What is a self-object? Self-object, very interestingly, observe the way Kohut writes it. Kohut does not write self, space and then object. Kohut writes self-object. It is one word. Self-object is one word. It's self-object. It's one word. Why Kohut uses this phrase? self hyphen object. <laughs> oh, who says early in life we all have a need for self-object experiences. Self-object experience means I relate to somebody who does what I ask him to do. So the other does not have a mind of his own. He behaves as though he is an extension of me. So he is a different system, a different body, but not with a mind of his own. Not that the mind does not exist, but that the person differs to me and does what I ask him to do. And this is true of many parents who do what the child asks them to do and make the child experience 
that they are not going to deny or defy what the child wants. This experience with the other, where the other is not a full other with a mind of his own, but with an obedient other, a other who differs to me and the other who obeys me and the other who pleases me and the other who always thinks about me. Such an other is what is called the self-object. An object who is distinct from me, but not distinct completely, in one psychological sense he is almost like an extension of me. Such an object, Kohut calls the self-object. Kohut says we all have a dream in early childhood for self-object experiences. And if we get people who are good enough, who differ enough, who don't oppose us, defy us, reject us, but go by our wishes, we get satisfied with the self-object experiences and we become ready for relating to the other. So from only self, we move first to self-object in object relations. So first it is the oceanic self, then we move to the self-object and then self-other. In fact, to put it on a continuum, it is the movement is from the self to self-object, to twinship, to alter ego, to the real other. That is how in Prohusian terms, the object relations movement would be. Pohut says, if self-object experiences are not experienced adequately and the desire is not quenched adequately, it can lead to pathology. And interestingly, in therapy, the client then tries to experience self-object experiences with the therapist. He wants the therapist to become a self-object because that is where the arrest is and unconsciously he wants the therapist to become a self-object so that the arrested process can start and he can move towards healing. In classical psychoanalysis, the therapist would interpret this need of the patient and try to make him realize it is a narcissistic, grandiose, futile, unrealistic desire and interpret it so that one can get past it and become an adult who can deal with the other. Contrast to this, Pohushan therapists allow the client to satisfy in therapy, mostly by acts of omission rather than commission, all that is unsatisfied in early childhood. And that is what takes a very long time and very deep holding and patience on part of the therapist. So the cohesion therapist will allow the client to have self-object experiences mostly enabled by acts of omission rather than commission. And once satisfied, the client then moves naturally towards relating with the therapist as the real other. Kohut says, without gratification, if you get into interpretation, these problems are repressed deeper and are not solved. So these problems, the self problems that Kohut talks about are not solved by interpretation, by, but only by gratification. And it is only after gratification in the therapy room, mostly enabled by acts of omission, rarely by acts of commission, the client is able to move forward and no amount of interpretation without gratification and holding can enable the client to move forward. 
21. What is twin sheep and alter ego needs? One way to define twin ship is a friendship where participation district is on. Some partial amount of self other element is present in the friend, but there is part element of the other also, and the two are compatible and complementing. Occasionally similar also. And this relationship, which essentially in simple language we would call friendship, is a twinship experience. Some people talk about twinship not as a relationship, but as a process involved in the relating. And they use this in many areas, including in alter ego relationships. But safe would be to say twinship is friendship, general friendship of a particular type where some sort of self object experience is present. Alter ego is the other, but somebody like me. Twinship is partial the other but largely unlike me, but compatible to me. Alter ego is the other who is like me. And this relating with somebody like me gives me a great narcissistic gratification. Often the alter ego is seen in adult life as somebody very young to an elderly narcissist. So an elderly narcissist would find a young person who is very like him or very like how he used to be and that person becomes the alter ego. And if I am not present in that meeting, he will be there and he will do by and large what I would do. Relating with such a person is what is called alter ego relationship. And Kohut says both these relationships are important to be experienced for development of a healthy self, not to the same extent as mirroring and idealization is. Mirroring, idealization, empathy are far more important than impingement is far more important than kinship or alter ego needs. But they are all important. Proportionately different, but important. 22. What is the difference in cohesion therapy and traditional psychoanalytic psychotherapy? Kohut lays emphasis on holding and empathy. Kohut says just provide holding. Don't start with psychoanalytic conventional interpretations. Don't bring in reality too early into the therapy room. So cohesion therapy is much longer than the classical psychoanalytic psychotherapy. One. Two. Kohut does not believe in giving classical psychoanalytic interpretations early in therapy, but he holds back the interpretations for much longer time. So in the initial period of cohesion therapy, holding empathy are provided. The client is enabled to experience self-object experiences, empathy, mirroring, idealization, all that leads to an arrest of development. He is enabled to experience. Only after a long period of holding and enabling of those experiences which could not be had and led to arrest of development, only after substantially long period of time all that has happened that slowly the conventional psychoanalytic interpretation is brought in. Kohut says premature psychoanalytic interpretations actually make the problems go deeper and more repressed. Third, for Kohut, the continuum of fame to shame is very important. Far more important than its given significance in psychoanalysis. Ocean therapy is radically different from psychoanalytic psychotherapy. 
Classical psychoanalytic psychotherapy is completely against gratification. Kohut is for gratification. Classical therapy is completely against inaction on the part of the therapist when an interpretation is called for or interpretations can be made. Kohut wants a more passive therapist, a more holding therapist. The cohesion therapist, to use a beyondian language, must have a very strong capability for enabling O. Kohut does not talk about O, but this is what cohesion stance enables. If a narcissistic client is expressing his grandiosity, classical psychoanalytic psychotherapist, say Kernberg, would interpret the grandiosity, be an agent of reality and interpret the grandiosity to the client to break that state of grandiosity. Kohut would allow the person to live out his grandiosity to his content and thereafter the client himself will start his movement towards health and move towards a realistic self. In personality disorders, we see the value of cohesion holding and the value of mirroring. Mirroring failure is almost universally seen in all personality disorders. And when we use ocean concept of mirroring, especially the five A's that I have detailed out of mirroring, it produces very good results in personality disorders. And often this long period of enabling the safe space is one of the most critical healing parts in personality disorders. Just provide a safe space a receptive space for self-expression and try to get into that state of O oh, that Bjorn talks about and try to actively activate O oh, if you can, if you know. At least have the intention of it or visualize it. It works very efficiently in all personality disorders, also in many cases of psychosis. 23. In what countries is pollution therapy popular? Covid has gone out of favor, very unfortunate. He has such precious concepts, both conceptually and in technique, that we have to excav excavate, appreciate Kohut and bring back or rather assimilate Kohut into our working. But as of now, Kohut is popular in the small area of United States, not many people are into Kohut these days. And self-psychology has is out of flavor of the day, self-psychology remains yet to be substantially assimilated in classical psychoanalysis. 24. What are the resources for self-psychology? Kohut is not a readable writer. Ernst Wolf has written extensively on Kohut. He is both good to read substantial and highly readable. From after Ernst Wolf, one can go to Kohut in the original. Self-psychology also has very good material. Self-psychology has a very good web presence and some of the websites are very rich with very valuable material on self-psychology. And lastly, you can go to the research papers after you are through with the online material. 
25, who are the important contributors after cohort in self psychology? Ernst Wolf, Arnold Goldberg, Stepensky, Stotzer, Paul Einstein, F. D. Phillips. They are some of the very important cohort thinkers who have extensively contributed to self psychology. With this, we will end the chapter on Ohud with a popular statement from Ohud. Empathy is the capacity to think and feel oneself into the inner life of another person. It's Ohud. Thank you.